Views and opinions expressed in this program are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect the views of BronxNet or the program underwriters. Hey, hey, it's the Bronx Buzz and Gary Axelbank with you. We come here every week and we do a reporter's roundtable and talk about all the important issues in the Bronx with people who, well, allegedly know something about it, at least they write about it, and you'll get to get a little inside word of what Bronx reporters are thinking and are writing about. Uh, tonight we have two wonderful uh, reporters. Uh, we will be joined in a moment by Marlene Peralta, many people know uh, from El Diario. She's no longer with El Diario. She's doing a lot of exciting work uh, uh, now. We're going to learn all about that. And uh, right now here on the set is uh, my buddy uh, Jarrett Murphy from City Limits. Nice to have you with us. Thanks uh, for having me I again, guess you're Jared. back on the show, yes, right? Yes, I know, a veteran. It's a, it's a young show, but he's already making his second appearance. Nice to have you with us. Great to be here. Um, anything new? I mean, we're going to talk about specifics, but just in general about City Limits. And, and as you know, I've said it to you personally, and I've said it in public, it's just a wonderful blog, and, and it's really chock full of information. We're not getting from some newspapers anymore. What's new? Anything new? Or well, different? what's new is that we're old. We're celebrating our 40th anniversary this wow. year. Wow. So we're celebrating it all year. We have a, a you know, star-studded gala planned for September. Okay. Uh, we're honoring uh, the great investigative journalist Wayne Barrett, who is my one of my mentors, and Henry Garrido, who of all has of the uh, has DC 37 and is going to be at World Trade Center 7. And you know, wow. it's uh, yeah, it's very exciting. Uh, your boy Gary will be invited. Of course, of course, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, because I like somebody's got to sing. Yeah, yeah. I, uh, yeah, right. That'll uh, work out very well. So a lot to talk about. Um, uh, uh, the, the first thing, you have uh, made it, uh, in a way, part of your stock and trade to do housing in, mm -hmm. in, in the Bronx and, of course, in the city of New York. Uh, most recently, um, we got a new look at rent regulations for the first time that I can recall. Two years in a row, no uh, 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 raises for, I guess it was one-year leases mm -hmm. and a very small raise for 2% two, 2 for two-year leases. Uh, what, what's your vision? What do you think? I mean, that is unprecedented. Even one year with a 0% increase is unprecedented. And now we're two years in a row. Two years in, and the year before that, 2014, was a 1% increase, which at the time was the lowest ever. It had never gone that low before through recession and Great Recession. It had always been 2%, 3%, and so on. Um, I mean, it, it's, it's hugely significant. You know, this is the, we're talking about building affordable housing. Rent stabilization is the most, the biggest, most effective affordable housing program we have. And it's under threat, uh, not just because the rents keep rising, but because as they rise, as you know, there's a certain threshold at which those units go out of the system forever. And right. every time you hike the rent, every unit in the city goes that much closer to that threshold. This obviously puts that off for a few years for you know those units that are that are close to that cutoff. Right. Well, the landlord organizations say, and you know, if you just look at very simple economics, they say, well, wait a minute, uh, water rates have gone up, and even though they went up. A lower percentage this year. Cumulatively, they have gone up historically higher than ever before. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the price of gas, the price of heating, uh, you know, the price of doing business is just going up. And so that's nice for you to say the tenants are doing well. But how can I? And you've heard from so many of these landlords. How can I manage the buildings? How can we keep doing this if we can't raise the rents? Well, that is their argument. I mean, the Rent Guidelines Board, by statute, has to analyze two things every year. One is the condition of tenants, the housing, the, the employment market, wages, poverty. The other is landlords, what kind of costs they face. And what they generated this year was that landlords' costs really hadn't gone up that much. You know, water to go up by a, a smaller amount than in recent years. Um, fuel, oil, all that stuff has always obviously been remarkably cheap. You know, taxes go up, but that's factored in. And the fact is the landlords had a, a number of, of years when uh, they were granted significant increases. All the years, not uh, a number of years, all the years. <laughs> all the years, significant increases, even if the cost didn't exactly justify it, while tenants, obviously, especially recently, have had a very tough time. This definitely is a sort of, I don't know, settling of accounts, I think, is probably how it can be you know, characterized. One, one way of looking at it. You know, um, I saw, I think it was Joe Strasberg from the Rent Stabilization Association afterwards said, well, these are all mayoral appointees. The whole system's got to go. I, and I will editorialize right now, and I think I even posted on my Facebook page, that um, it's ironic 
when a mayor who was favorable to the landlords was appointing the, the guidelines board members, uh, all of a sudden that was kind of a good system and that's the way it goes. And now obviously uh, uh, de Blasio purports himself to be a progressive, so to speak. And uh, that's, I guess, what you get. It is. And what's interesting is the, the kind of cleavage that's happening in the real estate community between people who build and develop housing, whom de Blasio has very much kind of allied himself with, and people who own and operate it once it's done, whom he has made his eternal enemies. You know, those two used to occasionally get along, but they really are kind of splitting over the way that this mayor is, is handling you know, their respective interests. Uh, I guess uh, running the city is about balance, and this is about as good an example of it over the course of years as, as anything. Um, you wrote about just a couple of hours ago about uh, the uh, resignation of um, Maya Wiley, who is the mayor's counsel. Uh, how connected to all the stuff we're reading about the mayor and having to defend himself against allegations, uh, how connected to that do you view this? I don't know. Um, I mean, I think that <laughs> <Good> uh, <answer. laughs> you know, the, the, a lot of people have departed the administration, and people have noted that today. There was, you know, Lillian Barrios Paoli about a year ago, the Commissioner of Housing Services in mm -hmm. December. It is not unusual for, for that number of people to leave, uh, leave office around this time in a mayor's term. It's a very exhausting job. You don't make that much money. So whether it's personal, whether it's working with the mayor, whether it's the scandals bringing her down, I don't know. Um, I think what's more significant about this particular departure is this departure, not trying to make it part of a constellation of other stuff. Uh -huh. She is, if you could identify anybody in his lineup who was most perfectly aligned with his politics, with Bill de Blasio's political culture, it's Maya Wiley, you know, woman of color from Brooklyn, daughter of a civil rights advocate, uh, NAACP, ACLU, founded the so so Center mm -hmm. for Social Inclusion, has degrees so, from Ivy so, League schools. So, why, so she, why do you she think is she's de Blasio in, in, in a different... You know, I think that it is, I think, I think it must be I very frustrating. I don't I think, think he has I think it, it's a floor. <laughs> it must be frustrating to be, to be there yeah. because there is the sense that the, the hope that de Blasio had as he was elected is evaporating through mistakes of his own, through um, resistance from other quarters. L last question. It, we read about it every day. We read about it in just about every city issue that comes up. Is the It's hard to call it anything else, the feud between the mayor and the governor. Um, is, what's at, what's at, at the base of this? I mean, they just don't like each other? <laughs> or is this a power play? I would say more on the governor's side than the mayor's just trying to survive. Or do you, like, what do you make of all uh, this? That goes to a level of psychoanalysis I'm not, I'm not <laughs> qualified for. I would say or that... political analysis, maybe. Uh, it, is, it is not going away. That's the biggest thing. I mean, this obviously is now hardwired into our politics. It will be the case as long as, you know, one is mayor and the other is governor. I think it's about territory. I think it's about uh, personality, taking umbrage. Um, but it's not, it's not going away. It's not going away. Uh, Jarrett, you and I are going to take a short break, and you will take a short break. We'll be right back, and uh, we'll enjoy having Marlene Peralta on the set. So don't go away. More buzz coming up. Me and my boy Matt had it good. He had catnip that was off the hook. But one day, he brings a girl home, and she's allergic to cats. Every sneeze was a nail in my coffin. Now I'm in a shelter. It's decent, but they don't even have Wi-Fi. I already knew that I was going to go to college, you know, from a young age. I definitely want to major in political science. After that, I'm going to get my law degree. Then I'm going to come back to Detroit, boost the economy, become the mayor or something, try to make the situation better for other people. I feel like I owe it to the city. I'm determined. It's, it, it's going to happen. My name is Justin, and I am your dividend.
I love taking care of my mom. It wasn't easy at first. She learned how to better communicate her needs. And you learned how to not ignore yours. I discovered how to make healthier meals. And I discovered how much I enjoyed them. Becoming a caregiver is a learning experience for everyone. Find articles, tips, and tools from experts and others who have been in your place. The Caregiving Resource Center at aarp.org slash caregiving. Okay, back with you on the Bronx Buzz, and uh, you've heard from Jarrett Murphy from City Limits. It is my pleasure to uh, present Marlene Peralta, who now is with Progressive Cities, used to be with El Diario, and she was rooted in that chair in room nine at uh, City Hall. Nice to have you loose and free and out <laughs> in the rest of the world. <laughs> Thank uh, you for having me. Do you me. enjoy what you're doing maybe compared to, to what you used to do? Is that a fair question to ask? Yes, I mean, I, it's, I thought it was going to be completely different. It's kind of not. I'm just on the other side of the media because I'm now pitching stories and making sure reporters are paying attention to certain things in different communities, that it be in housing or economic justice, health, mm -hmm. uh, all of those issues. I'm the one calling reporters saying, you know, I got a story for you. So, you know, I'm the one now, you know, calling room nine to get stories out there. <laughs> tell, tell me a little bit about Progressive Cities and, and tell our viewers, of course. Sure, yes. It's a consulting communications uh, for a firm. Uh, we do communication strategies and public relations for different uh, organizations. Most of them are nonprofit organizations who have campaigned, you know, to get better services for, you know, different communities here in the Bronx, Brooklyn, Manhattan, and different boroughs. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, public relations in general. Give me an example of a Bronx organization or some Bronx issue that you have dealt with uh, that, that motivates you, that inspires you to go, get up in the morning and go to work every day? Well, you mentioned rent stabilization. I work with CASA uh, closely, and they, you know, affordable housing is their issue, one of the many issues they, mm -hmm. they deal with. So I run a lot of the communications to make sure that the issues that they are pushing get visibility in the media as a way to pressure, you know, elected officials to act on it. You must, you and they must be doing a good job because my sense for the Jerome Avenue neighborhood study is that the community uh, voices are actually having effect on the way that the city is operating that study. They were ready to issue it, I think, even by the summer or whenever it was, and now they put it off because they keep saying we want to have more neighborhood input. Uh, tell me a little bit about, you know, the agenda there and what you hope to get out of it and if you're as satisfied as I'm alleging <laughs> with what the city is doing. Well, I don't think there is satisfaction yet. Oh, I mean, there's still I'm a lot to so be hard. done. <laughs> so yeah, no, there's still some uh, uh, uncertainties there. Hope, you know, we're hoping that the community would get as much as, as we can possibly get. You know, there's always concerns about how affordable, you know, the affordable housing being built is going to be for the local communities, for the local businesses there. A lot of the, you know, the uh, uh, mechanic shops that we have along Jerome Avenue also, you know, are uh, very skeptical about, mm -hmm. you know, what's going to happen to them once that area is mm -hmm. Uh, rezone. So there's a lot still up in the air. And, and there is a lot of history and even some very simple history. If you look at the Bronx Terminal Market, for example, there were some of those uh, owners, those bodega um, business owners, uh, did okay because they, they received a significant amount of money to move. Others just disappeared. And I'm going to just give my little editorial opinion because it is the buzz. And I believe it is not going to be possible to do that and save everybody. I think some people are going to be displaced, which might, may not make the people that you work with happy, but I do think um, uh, it might be the case. Just rewind the clock a little bit, different subject. Um, when you were at City Hall, the most dramatic, the most interesting, the most significant story or things that you worked on for El Diario that make you say, wow, I worked at City Hall and I was part of mm, what? <laughs> well, I think one of the most uh, stories that I'm the most proud of uh, had to do with the NYPD and diversity within the NYPD. Um, you know, they kept saying that, you know, the NYPD was very diverse, that a lot of Latinos and blacks were representing, you know, the force. But then I went and looked at the numbers and like, yes, you do, but in the lowest ranks. Once you go up ranks, you know, there's no color in there. 
Um, so that was kind of like one of the main stories that and, I worked on. And you on. believe, or do you believe that that's changed, maybe in part because of your advocacy in the work Yes, after that, I think it's a, true. there was a lot of appointments, because again, those positions were appointed positions. They were not you know, positions where you had to take a test. Mm -hmm. um, so there were a lot of appointments made afterwards. I mean, mm -hmm. there's still a lot of work to be done, and that, that's my favorite phrase. Right. But yes, a lot has changed ever since. Uh, one of my favorite things about doing this show is that before the show, I get to yap with reporters about what we really think and the stuff we're not even telling you guys. <laughs> but um, Jared and I were talking about um, a little bit of the frustration about the, the lack of local media and a lot of the issues that I bring up on Bronx Talk and we bring up here, uh, you know, we're kind of the only place that we do it aside from, you know, blogs like City Limits and some of the local papers. Um, talk to me now that you have a different view because you're trying to get stuff in the papers. If you have kind of a local issue like the Jerome Avenue neighborhood study uh, and you want to get it out there, is it difficult? Can you find media now that will take an interest in what local communities and local groups are saying. Yeah, that's that's a very you know limited you know number of media to do that. And if you go to the I mainstream, knew, I knew the answer by yes, the way. Yes, yes, of <laughs> course you do. <laughs> and if you go to the main papers, you know they're not gonna care unless you make it a big issue or a citywide issue. So yes, that's one of the I guess the challenges that some of these community-based organizations have about pushing those issues forward. It's you know giving them visibility and also having the actual media outlets to to get those issues out, and we have mm -hmm. very, you know, not that many. Is, is there a solution? I'm going to add also that we, you know, because we deal with all as much Bronx media as we can, um, and so even the addition of papers like uh, the Mott Haven Herald and the Hunts Point Express have really been helpful, and they're really very good papers. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, do you see anything on the horizon that would change this, or this is really the media landscape in the Bronx as we have it? Well, we have seen growth in the local, um, you know, local media. Uh, we didn't have that many weekly papers mm -hmm. back in the days. I mean, I started working in a weekly papers in Queens, and there were a handful. Where is that? Is there? <laughs> I don't even know what that is. I know is. It's, it's in the border, but that's it's, okay. It's out there. <laughs> Across the river. But, you know, we've seen a lot more. I mean, we have also Latino uh, weekly papers also that even though they don't print, uh, newspapers, they do online mm -hmm. um, uh, coverage. And the Bronx Free Press is a, a dual language paper, which yes. is a, an interesting uh, perspective and also important given certainly you, you don't have to be a genius to look at the numbers and see who, who's in the Bronx now. That's who it is. <laughs> That's what we got to do. Uh, Jarrett Murphy, Marlene Peralta, and, and you and you and everybody else, we're going to take a short break. Our buzz of the week is going to be about the recently completed 13th Congressional District Democratic primary. We'll talk about who won, who lost, why, et cetera, et cetera. We'll be right back. Buzzing with you. Don't go away. I'm David Lesh, legal correspondent to the morning show Open. If you have a legal question that you'd like me to answer, please send me an email at davidlesh at bronxet.org and I will address it on our Ask Your Lawyer segment. Okay, back with you on the Bronx Buzz. It is Jarrett Murphy from City Limits and uh, Marlene Peralta from uh, Progressive Cities, used to be with El Diario. Uh, let's start with you, Jarrett. Uh, 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 Adriano Espeat won by that many votes, just about, uh, as uh, the uh, Democratic uh, candidate for the 13th Congressional District. Let's just start with this. How do you see what happened there? I think your uh, blog wrote about the fact that it was limited uh, turnout, Very but I think turnout, that was yeah. somewhat predictable. That's mm -hmm. not a surprise to anybody. What do you think? I was surprised by the outcome. Really? Um, I was. I really thought that Wright had sewn up enough of the black establishment to really carry Harlem. 
and I did not expect for uh, Espayat to do uh, as uniformly well as he apparently did in, in the Bronx and Latino sections. Um, I, I, I live in that district. Um, and I do too. I noticed <coughs> going out on Tuesday that uh, Linares and Espayat were the only people really contesting the areas around us. You know, the only people who had placards, who had people giving out signs, no one else was present. Wright wasn't there, Clyde Williams wasn't there. Uh, Clayton Powell IV wasn't there. They really, and I think that was, I, I haven't looked at the ED level numbers yet, I don't think they're out, but I'd be curious to see just how much of a role the Bronx played. The Bronx, which is sort of new to that district, in the media coverage is often treated as if it's not part of that district. Uh, I'm well aware, in <laughs> fact, one of the media uh, called it the South Bronx, which yes. is like, hello, you know. <laughs> uh, I, I will just interject that I saw a map and it, it, I forget which publication, maybe in the Times or somewhere, and they color-coded uh, districts with who got what. I think the Bronx was extremely significant in turning this around, especially the part that goes down to you know, Marble Hill and mm -hmm. that area there, leading into uh, Washington Heights. All that, whatever the color was for Espiat was all that color. And I think uh, we, we or whoever voted in the Bronx should be proud that they had effect. I want to ask you a very pointed question. I was very frustrated by the dialogue that I heard. I saw it in the Times because that was their lead piece. I saw it on the New York One debate. And it was all about ethnicity. Jarrett's already referred to it. You know, is it a black district? Is it a Dominican district? Is it a Latino district? It frustrates me because these were candidates who either bring or not, don't bring something to the table. Um, what, what do you make of the fact, I, it is a historic thing that he's now going to potentially be the first Dominican uh, you know, elected to Congress. Um, was ethnicity the answer or was there something else involved here, which I'm going to bring up if you don't? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, yeah, ethnicity was the main focus of both the both leading candidates, and they made it just about, oh, I'm going to be the first Dominican-American in Congress. And or the this one, is a black district I'm gonna because say it's all. This, yeah. Exactly, this district is going to remain black. I mean, that, that was, and that was, that was what caused the division. You know, people were upset, and, and, and when the results came out, you know, a lot of um, issues came forward saying, you know, that there were uh, irregularities on both sides. Um, and it's all about the tensions because of the ethnic uh, uh, make of this. You know, it's taking over. Uh, that's how it's seen. When, if in the federal government, we all seen as people of color. There's no difference between the two communities, but that's what these, but that's, the old candidates did. Well, if you see steam coming out of my ears, <laughs> it's because there are such larger issues like, are you really qualified yes. to be, in, uh, you know, uh, and, and certainly in the debate we hosted, we tried to stick to, you know, is Obama doing okay with terrorism? Or, you know, how do you feel about other very important issues? And it was very interesting to me because in the New York One debate, while uh, they were really pushing that, the concept of, you know, ethnic politics, the candidates themselves started to get frustrated despite the fact that they were all pushing, <laughs> pushing the envelope. Well, I, think, I, I think part <laughs> of it, your, your debate tried to get at differences among them, but, but really it's a, it's a democratic primary in a fairly progressive city. Ideologically, most of those candidates who were here for your debate, and I'm sure in the New York One debate as well, many of their positions were very, very similar. Very similar. Um, you know, the qualifications, you could, you know, draw distinctions there, but, you know, it's a low turnout primary. People are going to vote according to surnames and whatever last mailer they saw. Um, in addition, it, you know, the, talking with friends, and I, I won't say who I voted for, but trying to figure out who the smart vote was, you know, do their policy positions even matter? They're going to be a junior member of a 200 plus person delegation so that will most likely, through is will most be likely be in the minority in that house unless something was really crazy in November. Um, what matters is not so much what they think about the drones or the Social Security Trust Fund, but will they off open an office in the Bronx? Will they do constituent services properly? Because that's the utility that this office will have for residents, at least in the, in the instant case. Uh, you know, I'm, this is my, uh, my chance to say what I think. I thought what Al Sharpton said, potentially, uh, allegedly, about Clyde Williams uh, was, was just a horrible thing to say. And maybe, in essence, if we go back to the ethnic politics, that you had three black uh, candidates, uh, that they, maybe they split the vote, as it were. So mm -hmm. that's my editorial comment about that. But the other thing which was out there is that Keith Wright was supported by the Bronx Democratic Party because uh, he was asked to step back when Carl Hastie was running as speaker as a favor to him. Mm -hmm. 
uh, they decided to support him. Uh, I'll ask you first, how embarrassing is this for the Bronx uh, uh, Democrats that they supported a candidate who they couldn't get through a primary? Well, I mean, that's all part of the politics, right? I mean, it's if, if you deliver for, for one, you got to deliver for the other, no matter what the chances are. Mm -hmm. I mean, now they have to face it. And I don't think, you know, I don't think they saw this coming, these results coming anyways. I mean, I think it might have been a, a... They made an a, assumption? You yeah, think? they made an assumption that he was, because he had all the backing of all the, you know, the main machines. So, so why did SPR win? All the Dominicans went out and voted for him. You, you think that that's that's true? Is that yes. it really was? I think you know a lot of the community that they, he they represents. See, and 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 again, going back to the ethnic politics that I personally reject, but maybe it's reality <laughs> I have to deal with. That maybe they saw this as an opportunity that others uh, that maybe uh, you know uh, other uh, candidates uh, didn't potentially see. Well, I, I would love to see what the numbers mm -hmm. are, you know, but I'm sure that you know it was overwhelmingly. You know, large. The, and the, the and by the way, we're going to need another half hour to we just <laughs> lobby because this is. If going the Bronx on Democratic forever. Party's coin has lost in currency, I think the New York Times endorsement probably has too. I mean, there's a few districts where that's the, right. They, they Clyde Williams, Clyde Williams, but Clyde Williams did get four thousand votes. If he hadn't been in the race, those votes go to right. He's your next congressman. So mm -hmm. I think I think if there was a, an ethnic vote, it was certainly partially split by as well as he did. I'll, I'll ask you both this question. Now, you've already established that he's you know, going to be a, a freshman congressman, potentially in the minority. Um, how do you think, uh, if, if it is SBI, we don't, there will be an election, but presumably the Democrat will win, as always happens. How do you think he's going to do? I mean, do you think, think he's going to be able to put a stake in the ground and, and, and say, well, okay, I'm going to become something, like potentially like Rangel did? Uh, I don't know. You know, I mean, uh, it's hard to think back 46 years ago what Rango, what Rango looked like. <laughs> we were um, all so small. Who we can were, beat that? Some of, us, <laughs> some of us just an idea at that point. But uh, I don't know. I mean, you know, I think that he is not a person who comes across as a specially polished politician. Right. Um, that might be a good thing. There might be instincts there. Uh, who knows when he'll have a chance to, to shine through. And, and certainly I have to ask you the same question. Well, my hope would be that he would represent the district you know as a whole that he's not going to be seen as oh he's only catering to dominicans because that was part of the um complaints that some had about Rango that he kind of you know did not pay attention to the latino well, he side certainly of the didn't district. pay attention to the bronx you can do <laughs> ethnic bronx, all you exactly. want but he certainly didn't pay. i mean we know that so you know i'm hoping that we'll see some leadership there to try to unite, like you said, you open up uh, office in the Bronx, you know, and all the different areas that were, right. you know, left behind. Uh, we really have to end the show. I'm so sorry to say. So, folks, we're going to go, but we're going to be here chatting while you guys are whatever you're doing. Thank you so much for joining us in the Bronx Buzz. Thank you, uh, Jared Murphy, and thank, thank you, you Marlene Peralta. Thank you. And uh, we'll be back like next week, right? Did you make a picture of me? No, you erased it already. All right. See you next week. Good night. I'm the host of Wednesday's Open right here on BronxNet Television, Channel 67, and also on Verizon Files, Channel 33. I want to invite you every Wednesday, you get an opportunity to see what's going on in the world of news, current events, debates, public information. That's what happens here on Open every Wednesday. So we invite you to join us.